All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Josh Beckman. I'm one of the neurosurgeons, part of uh, NSO, and I appreciate you guys joining me here. I think it's right around noon time, so we're right on time to talk about neck pain today, the causes and the treatment. Um, you know, I want to give a shout out to some of my colleagues. I think my buddy, Dr. Mobley, did a Facebook Live session on the treatment of back pain a couple of weeks ago. That's a fantastic procedure. He did a great job. And as part of the NSO and Centura organization, we really like to educate our audiences on different par paradigms. And so today, we're going to talk about neck pain. So I really have five talking points. Um, first one's going to be an introduction, or introduction to neck pain. Then we're going to talk about the common locations that I see in my clinic. Then we're going to talk about x-ray findings. And then the potential therapies. A lot of them are disc replacement, an artificial disc, possible fusion, uh, possible laminectomy. And then lastly, and I think this is probably one of the more important aspects, is what are your goals and expectations? So as you're coming to see me or one of my colleagues or any really spine surgeon, your expectations, you should have a really good understanding of what your expectations are. You know, I want to be in clinic for, to look at my left-sided arm pain, I want to know the surgical options, I want to know the conservative therapy, all this stuff. So you should have a goal and expectation you want to accomplish in every doctor's visit that you go to. So. A little bit about me. My name is Josh Beckman. I'm a board certified neurosurgeon. Um, I come from a wealth of experience. I was, you know, fortunate enough to serve in the military for four years and I got to help a tremendous amount of people. When I was there, I was the vice chair of neurosurgery and I was the director of spinal surgery at our nation's largest military hospital in San Antonio. Um, we had the active duty population, we had retired population, we were a level one trauma center, so we saw trauma. So I'm very fortunate to be able to help out a lot of people uh, and, and get a wealth of experience. And a little bit more about me is my approach to care is a stepwise approach. And so I like to go and do the least invasive therapies first or potential reversible therapies before undergoing any type of surgical intervention. Um, and I, I try to tell people like it is. I, my one main goal is to treat everybody as a family member. So, you know, if you're sitting behind me in the office, I'm gonna treat you like my brother or my sister or my father and recommend that same treatment for everybody. And I'm kind of impatient. And so when we decide that you need surgery, I like to get you to surgery within two to three weeks uh, because being in pain is kind of unreasonable. And if we have a way to help you out with that, we like to move fast and not like, oh, you can come see me, but then we have a four month wait. You know, that's not the way I try to operate. So. Um, during this little presentation, it'll probably be about 20 minutes. Um, you guys type questions and we'll answer them at the end. And uh, um, I really appreciate your time. So let's look into neck pain. Um, almost all of us have had neck pain before. You go to sleep, you wake up, your neck hurts, you've been in a car wreck, you have a whiplash injury. Fortunately, most of them get better with time. Um, but in the past two years, COVID, combination of smartphones, ha really have not helped. And I found out about this thing called text neck. And uh, if you look at the bottom of the screen here, you know, you, if you, we have this kind of cone of symmetry or stability in spine surgery. And so when we're up looking, we have good posture, our head weighs about 10 to 12 pounds. But the moment you turn down and look at your phone, all of a sudden you look at that second one where your head almost doubles in weight. And so you're putting a lot of strain on the back of your neck. And if you look at that x-ray above, you can see the red circle there. It's circled with, you know, degenerative arthritis. If you look way down, you know, and you look all the way to the right, you have a 60 degree angulation of your neck. Well, then all of a sudden your neck weighs 60 pounds. So it's almost six times as much as you normal do in your cone of symmetry. And so what that's doing is putting excess strain on the back of your neck. And we're all guilty of it. You know, I'm doing it right now looking at this presentation. I look at my phone. That's where it is. But, you know, we have to make an effort to stay upright. Um, and it's the text neck thing is so interesting that there's been some research about it. So for instance, association between text neck and neck pain in adults. Um, the effects of cervical flexion angle, which is what you see down there during smartphone use on muscle fatigue and pain in the erectus spinal muscles. Um, you know, the effect of technology devices on cervical lordosis. We're all looking down and we're all having more neck pain from it. What's the last one? Association between mobile phone use and neck pain in university students. So it's a real thing out there. COVID has kind of made us all angry and then maybe possibly sedentary and it's, it's a challenging thing. So, you know, our posture is an important thing to improve upon. Here's getting to the meat of the subject. So neck pain location. If you look at this part, you know, the most common factor of neck pain that I see is you're either gonna have arm pain where it starts here and shoots down your arm. 
Um, some people have this central dull aching neck pain. And then a lot of people have this shoulder blade pain. And this shoulder blade pain is really, really interesting because some people come to me, it's like, yeah, my neck hurts. And then they point and I go up to them and I point literally right here or right here. And I was like, is this your pain? And they're like, oh my gosh, how'd you know? And that's where the physical examination comes in. And so what you have to do is understand very detailed where your neck is. Some people have really chronic, you know, low grade dull pain right here. Some people have a sharp stabbing pain and that's the information that I need to know or any of your surgeons need to know to make a decision. Um, and when you come and see us in clinic, that's why we ask, how long has your neck pain been there? Do you have neck pain and arm pain? Is it mainly midline pain or is it off to the side? Is it between your shoulder blades? And I think the most common pain that I see is between the shoulder blades. And that's a referred pattern from C5, C6, C6, C7, typically, which are the most commonly degener degenerated uh, bones of your neck because that's where all your movement comes from here and here and here. Um, are you having muscle cramps? A lot of people, I was previously in the military, I had a common complaint, everybody does push-ups. And some guys were telling me, like, I can do 80 push-ups before in a minute. Now I can only do 30 and my left arm's going out on me. So that tells me their triceps out. And then I get an x-ray and an MRI and all of a sudden they have a disc herniation. And so that type of information of where your neck pain is located, how long it's been there is really, really important. And one of the common mis misconceptions I have is that interscapular shoulder pain is actually shoulder pain when in effect it's your nerve root being compressed and it's a referred pain pattern. And these just illustrate what we find in clinic. So if you come through, you have neck pain, the first thing that your primary care providers are probably going to do is order an x-ray of your neck. And if you look at these x-rays, and let's see if I can get the mouse up. So the mouse, you guys seeing the mouse here? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so if you look at the mouse, um, you can see that this level right here is a normal level. So that's C3, you come down, that's C4, and then you come to C5 right here, it looks like that the bone is expanding and they have anterior bone spurs right here and then bone spurs in the back. And this is where your spinal canal resides. You have bone spurs here and bone spurs here. And common findings come to me, is like, well, I want to go over my x-ray findings. And the radiologist is going to read something like, multi-level degenerative disc disease, including moderate spondylosis with disc space narrowing and in-plate osteophyte bridging at C5, C6, and C6, C7. What does that mean to you? Probably that you have like a terrible neck and it really freaks some people out. And if I'm looking at it, it says that, well, you have lived an active lifestyle and you have arthritis in your neck. And when we talk about arthritis in the neck, all of us have arthritis in your neck. I have arthritis in your neck. Everybody in this room has arthritis in their neck. If I took an x-ray of every single 50-year-old throughout the nation, they're going to have arthritis in their neck. And the real question is, is not do you have arthritis, because you might as well say you do, is how does your body handle it and how do you respond to it? And some people have hit the genetic lottery and they have a huge spinal canal and the bones can grow back into the spine as much as they want to and then they don't get symptomatic. Whereas others maybe aren't so lucky and born with a narrow spinal canal and say have chronic degenerative cervical narrowing and then they get very symptomatic. And then some people have just a small bone spur and are very symptomatic. So it's really important to understand a patient specific approach. So you have neck pain, you've seen your physician, um, you're still fighting with it, maybe hopefully it went away, sometimes it didn't, but you're searching for a treatment. And then when you come to see me or any other type of neurosurgeon or spine surgeon, you know, the first things that we're going to ask you is, what have you tried? Um, a lot of people said, man, I've tried everything. I've tried physical therapy, I've pain medicine, pain management, I've tried literally everything, chiropractor. Uh, and then, you know, after that, you kind of get a little bit down because you feel like nothing works. And that's a problem. And that's what we're here for. Uh, some others be like, well, you know, I was in an accident, I was hiking in the woods, I fell down, and my neck hurts. And, you know, we're going to ask, have you tried physical therapy? Have you tried cervical traction? So there are a lot of different treatment options. We just have to find where you are within that treatment paradigm. And then some of the surgical options, which is likely what people want to know about, is, you know, what are the options for surgery once I've done all this? Is it a disc replacement? Is it a fusion? Is it some other type of really neat therapy that no one's heard of? But the, the majority of it are a disc replacement, which the evidence is really, really good, or a neck, neck fusion from the front, which is called an ACDF, which stands for anterior discectomy infusion. So going back in, let's take a look at these x-rays. 
two very similar looking x-rays, uh, but very different treatments. So if you look at the one on the top, uh, if you count down, this is C1, this is C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. So the two most common degenerative findings that we see amongst anybody over the age 40 or 50 are C5, C6, and C6, C7. And this treatment up here, if you look on the left side, these were two level disc replacements. Well, if we go down to the next one, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and C6, C7. So very similar, C5, C6, and C6, C7, same thing. Well, guess what? This patient had a two level neck fusion. And you can tell the difference. There's a plate here, there's screws, there's spacers where bone's growing through. Over here, there's just, you see these small metal implants. They're titanium with a little clarity in the middle, which keeps motion. So we had a disc replacement on the top, and then we had a fusion on the bottom. And why is that? Well, the patient on the top was younger, and they had pains, they had pain in their interscapular region and pain shooting down their arms. So they had what we call as a radiculopathy and referred interscapular pain. The patient on the bottom was a little bit older, and then they had the chronic neck pain that was in here, and then they couldn't really point to it, and we didn't have a really good target to treat, per se, from just a single nerve root. And so their pain is likely associated with all the movement of these small joints back here called your facet joints and your spinous processes, and then your paraspinal muscles. And so the treatment paradigm is very different, um, and we work to it as a team, you know, between the patient and myself and all of our PAs and nurse practitioners to provide a very patient-specific treatment for you. And so here, I just want to reiterate, a lot of people all have arthritis. And the question is, do they respond well or do they not respond well to it? And then what is their pain pattern? And those are the big factors that we have when we're looking at you as patients. Um, so, working together as a surgeon patient team. Um, when I started talking, I talked about goals and expectations. Anytime you guys come see me in clinic, the first thing I'm gonna ask you is, what are your goals and expectations? What do you wanna accomplish from this? A lot of people say, well, I just wanna get better. And that's a reasonable expectation, but you know, you gotta hone it down. It's like, all right, I wanna know what are the surgical options, what are the conservative options, what are the non-surgical options, how bad is it? What if I go on a 10 mile hike tomorrow, am I gonna hurt my neck, you know? And so we sit down and we have a good conversation and I try to accomplish those goals and expectations for you. Then we look at your images, say, okay, I go up, pull up your x-rays and your MRI and I say, what is your main pathology? What is your pain generator? And then some patients, their CTs and MRIs and x-rays look perfect. They don't have any instability on dynamic imaging. Everything looks good, but they still have a significant amount of pain. And I don't have a surgical target to treat, so I say, well, maybe we need something else like neuromodulation, which can be discussed at a different time. And then another thing about me is that I encourage second opinions. You know, my most important thing is that I want you to be confident and comfortable with the decision that you're making. You know, if you go out and talk to someone else and talk to a friend, oh, I had this and that, um, and then you come back and then you feel a little bit more confident. And when you're confident in your surgical decision or non-surgical decision, you do better. Um, so the evidence that we have for disc replacement or an artificial disc in the neck is probably some of the best evidence we have in the literature amongst like hip replacements and everything else, even throughout orthopedic literature. It's very, very, very good evidence, but you have to determine if you're a patient, you know, if you're a candidate for it. One of the contraindications for an artificial disc would be that you have chronic neck pain because you can have pain from the joints in the back of your neck, you can have pain from the bones in the front of your neck, you can have pain from the disc, and likely that pain is made worse by significant movement going up and down. And so if I go in there and clean all that arthritis up, and we come back to the last slide, so if you look at this image right here, um, notice how those bone spurs are in the back right there? Well, look at that, all of it's clean, it's gone. The bone spurs are not there in the front. Same thing down here, bone spurs in the front, bone spurs in the back. If you look at this post-operative image, all of them are gone, so it cleans up really well. But in this patient, if I put in artificial disc, I would have made him or her move significantly more as opposed to a fusion, which would make her pain generators worse. And so that's why we elected for a fusion. This pain generator was probably from a nerve root compression, and then you, decompre or you decompress the nerve root and put in an artificial disc, and you actually increase movement. So everybody's different, very patient-specific approaches. So 
Um, you know, the last one is I want to put out there for better neck posture. Please don't have tech snack. I tell my wife and my daughters, okay, don't look at your phone like this. Keep your neck up because we're all eventually going to do like this. And I know that everybody's seen someone in the grocery store walking around and they're kind of hunched over like that. And we want to avoid that, you know, keep good posture, keep everybody up and try to try to really help yourself with your posture and overall cone of balance. And the way I like to think about neck pain is kind of like, or any type of pain, back pain, neck pain, or anything, is like weight loss. You know, if you go out and run five to 10 miles, then, you know, you're not gonna lose five pounds in a day. It takes about three to four weeks to really start seeing benefits. And the same thing with surgery. We go through with surgery, you're not gonna feel better the next day. It's a long paradigm. You have to exercise, go through your post-surgical re regime, see physical therapy, and at that four week mark, you should be doing much, much better. But if you start going back and you start, you know, doing unhealthy things, then guess what? The pain's going to come back. You know, if you go eat uh, a lot of stuff and don't exercise, then the weight's going to come back. So it's always a working progress, and we're always trying to be the, the best that we can. Um, yeah, and that concludes uh, my little presentation on neck pain. Um, you know, here, if you guys would like to call to make an appointment to discuss anything further, please give this number a call and hit option two. I've got some questions that are being passed to me now. Um, I have I think I blocked some clinic. I think I blocked about uh, a couple of hours tomorrow, and then some clinic next week. Uh, if anybody have any, has any specific questions. Okay, uh, first question here. So I am experiencing neck pain from computer work. Which doctor should I go to first? Great question. Um, I think your first line of therapy should be your primary care provider. Um, they usually have a good way of working you up. Sometimes people don't have a primary care provider. Sometimes um, they just can't have access to them. And if you're having that type of neck pain and you can't get access to there because they know you the best, then you should likely come see one of us. Uh, we're happy to see you on that one. Um, okay, here's another question. Okay, I feel like I've tried everything do I have to live with my pain? That's a great question. Um, these questions are fun. Uh, I love questions. That's what I tell all my patients. So, uh, no, but you do, I don't think you have to live with your pain. We have a lot of different types of treatment modalities that can help with that. So, you know, it seems like you're probably one of the patients that have tried physical therapy, pain management, epidural steroid injections in your neck, um, you know, even pain pills, and you're like, man, nothing's helping. And so maybe you've even tried a spinal cord stimulator, but there's always a secondary option. And if there's not, I'll tell you, I said, hey, listen, I'm sorry, I don't have a target to treat. And, you know, we can work together to try to think of something creative to help you out. Um, but it never hurts to get a second opinion, to have a fresh set of eyes look at something. Um, usually when you're in pain and nothing has absolutely worked for you, it's very challenging to get your pain completely gone. But let's say we take your pain from a nine down to a four. I think that's a very reasonable expectation. All right, another question. Do I have to stop my outside activities if I have surgery? Um, great question. With, you know, every single physician and surgeon is a little bit different. Uh, my thought is if I bring someone to surgery, then my goal is to get them back outside and be as healthy and as active as possible. So I'll give you an instance. I was part of a, a huge program when we did a lot of surgery and evaluation for our special operations forces, fighter pilots, everything else. So I had this young guy, he was about 22, um, he was going for selection uh, in the special forces in the army and he had a bad neck herniation and he had actually weakness in his arm. And so we went in and did a disc replacement on him. Uh, he did fantastic from the surgery. And at three months, he was 100% healed and he was out doing his thing. And he still texts me all the time um, and he's doing well because I told him, I said, you have to show, you have to let me know that you're doing well. And uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to help him. And so it, either you have a disc replacement or a fusion, um, you can certainly go back out and do activity. And, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a person who really puts people in collars unless you have some really severe medical conditions. Um, uh, I'm pretty confident in the hardware that we put in. Um, and so I, it's rare for any of my patients to be in a neck collar after surgery unless it makes you feel comfortable. All right, next question. Are there any exercises or stretches to help me out 
with TechSnack? <laughs> Great question. We're still studying that. So I think the best thing to do is look at yourself and look at where your ears are. And when you're standing up, you want to make sure that your ears are above your shoulders. Because when I'm doing down like this, you know, my ears are in front of my shoulders. And so having good posture is one of the really important things to do. There's not too many exercises that say that to increase posture, it's more of a global body balance issue. Um, you can't really stretch your neck. If you go to physical therapy, they can put you in cervical traction is where they put a traction on your neck. And some people that is very beneficial in. And I have some patients that we put in, they buy a home traction kit and we put them in every day. So that's a really, really nice way to improve your lordosis. But you have to go through physical therapy first or come see us first. Okay, some more questions. What are minimally invasive options? So, minimally invasive spine surgery is typically reserved for the low back. And the reason is, is that when you're going in the low back, you're trying to avoid destroying muscles and cutting muscles from the bone and suturing them up. I would say that any type of surgery from the front is our baseline surgery. It's called you know, an anterior front approach and we make a small incision right here. That is the least invasive that you can do out of all the surgeries that we can do. And that one by far is the standard of care that we have. Um, you know, let's say, well, maybe I want a minimally invasive disc, you know, um, ablation or something like that. That first off, that that's a rare entity. But secondly, there's nothing that we're, where we can do as a surgeon put a needle in there and correct a lot of arthritis. So if you look at this patient, you know, this down here, down low, you can see those bone spurs. There's nothing minimally invasive that I can do to treat. It has to be done surgically, and most of the time we like to go from the front. Sometimes. Uh, if we have to, or there's a contraindication, we can go from the back. But in the neck, there's really not too many minimally invasive treatments because there's not very much soft tissue to go through. Great question, though. I've never been asked that one. Um, is that in or if experiencing pain? If experiencing pain, is it better to have surgery earlier when you're young and healthy, or does age matter? That's another really great question. So it just depends on what type of surgery you have. My inclination is if we can get you by without doing any type of surgery on you or delay it a little bit, then that would be my recommendation. And the reason for that is, is let's say if you're young and healthy and you have a disc herniation, well, we'll treat you with some anti-inflammatories, maybe you know have a pain management physician do a steroid injection for you. And I have seen, I actually saw a patient last week in my clinic where his neck disc herniation completely resolved and he's better. And so if you bring your patients and give it six to eight weeks, then sometimes that pathology goes away and you don't need surgery. Now, if you have a muscle weakness, like you can't pick things up, um, you can't do a push up or you're exercising or something like that, then you should certainly consider having surgical intervention because the nerves are being compressed and the longer they're being compressed, the less likely are they are to heal uh, with any type of intervention. So certainly age matters, but it just depends on on where you are, what your pathology is, uh, and that's a conversation that we should have in clinic, you know? Great question, I like that one. Okay. <laughs> How would I schedule an appointment? I'm ready to feel better. Um, it's another great question. Well, I would say call that number here, 720-638-7500, hit option two. Um, that's our Lakewood office. You know, it's myself there. We have great colleagues, my colleague, Dr. McGowan, Dr. Hudson, and Dr. Bonin. Uh, all of us can certainly see patients, and, and we're all well qualified, and we, we work together as a team. And I am very big into the team mentality. Any more questions over there? Yeah. We got one more? Okay. How's our time? Okay. Yeah, okay. So what is recommendation to address cervical hypermobility? That is a great question. And you know, my follow-up question would be, first off, how is the cervical hypermobility diagnosed? Was it diagnosed with a flexion and extension film or something called a dynamic x-ray? Um, if that's the case, then we need to make the determination is, is your neck hypermobile or are you unstable? Uh, meaning, that our neck and all of our bones in our back kind of work like coke cans stacked on one another. So we're able to do this and do this, but we shouldn't do this and slide. And when you start sliding, uh, that's a problem. And a really interesting uh, case study is I had my, 
OR nurse, and when I was in the military, she came to me and says, you know, Dr. Beckman, I'm having a lot of neck pain. And so the first thing they ordered was something called dynamic imaging reflection extension x-rays. And at C5, C6, lo and behold, you know, she started slipping, and that was the cause of her pain. And that can be considered hypermobility. The medical term for that is spondylolisthesis. And yes, you have to practice to say that word. I did when I was a resident, but that's the medical term for it. Um, and so that's what we really need to figure out. Uh, there are other instances of hypermobility with um, soft tissue disorders uh, that, are, that are a little bit on the more rare side and we just have to have a discussion. It's a great question. Okay, one more, they keep coming. Do you have any suggestions to prevent, as I say, waking up with stressed neck? Oh man, that's a hard one. Um, we all sleep a little bit differently. Uh, you know, we'd have to take a look at your x-rays and see what you, see how you did with physical therapy, cervical traction. Um, we all kind of wake up and go to bed stressed or neck muscles are tight. Um, you know, if you have a disc herniation, that can cause muscle tightness. You know, I would ask, you know, have you gone to your primary care provider? Have they provided any muscle relaxants? What's going on? Is your neck pain better when you're lying flat in bed and you're relaxed? Or does that make it worse? Um, a lack of sleep can certainly cause neck pain, and then neck pain can cause a lack of sleep, and you start in this vicious cycle and you go down. Um, and it's just really hard to determine uh, any preventative mechanisms for waking up with stressed neck. I think that you should probably be worked up, and first off with x-rays, to see if there's anything going on there. All right, another one? So does spinal cord stimulation work for arm pain caused by a disc problem? I think that spinal cord stimulation works for a lot. What's really nice about spinal cord stimulation is that it can cover a lot of entities. And I want to reflect back on the target. Now, so let's say you're having arm pain, you get an MRI and a CAT scan and it shows nothing. Everything's the same. So I'm like, gosh, man, I don't have a target to treat. So the next step is, it's not to diminish your pain, but it's said, okay, Let's understand this pain, and this pain is likely aberrant, um, and we we'll, can use a spinal cord stimulator to modulate your pain receptors so that you don't feel them quite as much. Um, you know, but if you do have a disc problem, sometimes the disc problem is compressing the nerve, and the, and the only treatment for that is just to decompress the nerve, whether it's with a disc replacement or a fusion or a small laminotomy in the back. There's a couple of mechanisms for that. And so that would be something that we'd have to look at with your MRI and x-rays and just a basic clinic appointment. Okay, well that's all the questions. I really appreciate you guys uh, coming here and listening and spending some time with me. Uh, like I say, you know, we're part of a wonderful group. Uh, and we're a one-stop shop and let us know if you need anything. You guys have a great day.